about you. <laughs> Thank you. Lisa Owen is next with Checkpoint. This is Checkpoint on RNZ National. I'm Lisa Owen. Heidi Akine. Corrections is investigating self styled justice reformer Scott Guthrie after allegations he charged an inmate's family thousands of dollars for advice and support dealing with the department in breach of regulations. The family wants its money back and is warning others to stay right away from him. COVID rule busters could get stung with monster fines as the government beefs up penalties. Associate Health Minister. Minister Penny Henare joins us live. Auckland builders get ready to get back to work but warn the lockdowns put construction deadlines up the spout. Taranaki health bosses go the whole hog. Literally, get a jab and a bacon butty. You can watch us live on Facebook. Ahi ahi marie, RNZ News at 5. Ko Sarah Thompson tōko ingoa. The Prime Minister is urging unvaccinated Aucklanders to go and get their first jab before the city comes out of Level 4 lockdown. The region will move to Alert Level 3 at midnight for at least two weeks. Jacinda Ardern says 79% of Aucklanders have now had their first dose of the vaccine. She says the vaccine gives people and their workmates a crucial layer of protection. Every remaining unvaccinated person is a risk and poses risk. So my challenge to Auckland is now this. Let's keep going. Let's see if we can get to 90% by the time that Cabinet considers our Alert Level 3 settings in two weeks' time. Now, that is an ambitious challenge, but it is doable. I've seen modelling which suggests that if we go hard and do this right, we can reach that goal, but it will require a team effort. Jacinda Ardern says people should encourage those around them to get vaccinated too. The government announced today that fines for breaching COVID-19 restrictions will increase sharply. The maximum fine for an individual breaching restrictions will rise from $300 to $4,000. For companies, the maximum will rise to $12,000. One of the 14 cases of COVID-19 reported today is a person who recently snuck past security at North Shore Hospital to visit a patient. The Director-General of Health, Ashley Bloomfield, says CCTV footage at the hospital has been examined and about 20 staff have been stood down. Dr Bloomfield says he's concerned people are deliberately trying to avoid security arrangements and potentially putting staff and patients at risk. We are working with the DHB to see if there is anything else we need to do to help um, support uh, that sort of thing not happening again. A large number of people have again been tested at two pop-up centres in Upper Hauraki on the Firth of Thames. 300 people have been swabbed today at Farikawa Marae near Kawawa and 105 at the Mangatangi Marae. This is on top of 357 people yesterday. Upper Hauraki is now designated to be in Level 4 lockdown until Friday following the discovery of four community cases in the area. The Climate Change Minister has defended the decision to go to the COP26 conference in Glasgow in November. James Shaw and his delegation will be given special managed isolation allocations upon their return and they will not affect the number of spaces available for emergency cases. The decision to send a delegation to the climate change talks has sparked backlash from opposition parties. However, Mr Shaw says this conference is probably the most important since the Paris Agreement. That's because uh, the scale of what countries have put up in terms of their ambition does not yet meet the requirement for staying within 1.5 degrees of global warming. So there's a lot of pressure at this conference uh, for countries to participate. James Shaw says this will be the smallest delegation New Zealand has sent in many years. Taranaki District Health Board is adding a bit of sizzle to make getting a vaccine a bit more appetising. Anyone who turns up for a shot at its new Plymouth COVID-19 vaccination clinic between 7 and 9am tomorrow will be treated to a bacon butty. At 20%, 28% of the eligible population, Taranaki has the worst vaccination rate in the country. Bevan Clayton-Smith, who heads the region's vaccination programme, says the fry-up is just one idea to maximise opportunities for people to get vaccinated. 
Nationals leader Judith Collins has taken a swipe at the party's own pollster after one of its surveys showed Nationals' support crashing. A Courier poll commissioned by the Taxpayers Union last week put the opposition party on just 21%. National has long used the polling company to survey public opinion, but Ms Collins says she's focusing on more important matters. I do not worry about things like polls because polls go up and down and most pollsters would refuse to poll during a level four lockdown. It's four minutes past five. Moving now into sports news, the Black Caps are on their way home from Dubai after their aborted tour of Pakistan. The 34-strong New Zealand team left Pakistan hurriedly at the weekend, citing a security threat just hours before their one-day series was due to start in Rawalpindi. Black Camp scalper Tom Latham feels for Pakistan counterpart Baba Azam, who was proud of being able to play at home again. I remember doing the, the captain's uh, run with them, uh, with, with Bubba, uh, the day before and how happy he was to have us there. Uh, you know, he was obviously very excited and I guess it was a historic moment as well for New Zealand cricket to be back there 18 years since since they were last there. So uh, to be part of that was going to be something special, but um, obviously things changed. England has now also decided to abandon upcoming tours of Pakistan. Cyclists and coaches who've previously been muzzled will be able to speak freely to an independent panel set up to investigate athlete welfare. A four-member panel, including lawyer Michael Heron, will carry out the investigation, which has been launched in the wake of cyclist Olivia Podmore's sudden death in August. Heron led a similar investigation into the sport three years ago, but those who spoke to him signed confidentiality agreements. Cycling New Zealand CEO Jacques Landry says his organisation won't know who the panel talks to, with all names redacted from the final report. There wouldn't be any retaliation uh, on any on any athlete. We want to actually be able to actually move forward on this. We want to be able to actually know that uh, whoever has spo- spoken uh, has spoken in in a in an area in an ethos that is that is very much a safe one. And that's the news. Aucklanders prepare for a little more freedom. I feel such a relief because uh, yeah, it's been five weeks now and it's been quite long. With one sleep to go for cafe coffee. I think it's really good news, um, especially for, I think, businesses in the city. Modeler Sean Hendy gets it. Part of me is, you know, thinking about takeaways. <laughs> Valuable radio. Morning report weekdays from 6 on RNZ National. Te reo irirangi o Aotearoa, funded through New Zealand On Air. Now the short forecast from Met Service to Midnight Rāpa Wednesday. Northland to Taranaki, also Coromandel, Bay of Plenty, Taupo and Taumaranui. Partly cloudy with isolated showers. Rain in Northland tomorrow night, possibly becoming heavy. Taihape, Whanganui and Manawatu, also Gisborne to Wairarapa. Generally fine today, partly cloudy tomorrow with isolated showers in the west from afternoon. Kapiti and Wellington, cloudy periods and isolated showers today. Occasional rain tomorrow. Marlborough, Nelson and Buller, cloudy periods today with showers in Buller, periods of rain tomorrow, possibly heavy at times. Westland, rain with some heavy and thundery falls, mainly fine tomorrow with scattered rain at night. Fiordland will see occasional showers tonight, possibly becoming thundery, isolated showers tomorrow. Canterbury, Otago and Southland will see heavy rain about the Canterbury headwaters, scattered showers elsewhere with possible thunderstorms in Otago and Southland, mainly then fine tomorrow, however mostly cloudy about the Canterbury Plains with morning showers for coastal Southland. And for the Chatham Islands, cloudy periods and showers is late tomorrow. That concludes the short forecast from Met Service to Midnight Rāpa Wednesday. It's seven minutes past five. Kia ora rā, Sarah. Tēnā koutou katoa, no mai haere mai ki checkpointi tēnei rā, ko Lisa Owen tēnei. Tonight, what price for justice? Corrections has launched an investigation and suspended the visitor privileges of a self-styled justice reformer following allegations he charged an inmate's family thousands of dollars for support and advice in dealing with the department. The Northland family has a relative in prison and was concerned about his conditions in health. They were referred to Scott Guthrie. Scott Guthrie's previously worked with at least two other established justice charities and left both of them under a cloud. The Northland family believed his advocacy and advice was charitable, free. But as family spokesperson Donna explains, they soon discovered dealing with Scott Guthrie comes at a price. $9,250.
So this is people's savings here? This is people's savings. We drew money out of Kiwi Bank, which was re- retirement fund money. So out but of the was... Kiwi Saver, you took it out? Yes. yes. He gave me the impression that it was a charity. Um, he, he told us that he worked for Sensible Sentencing Trust. He told us he worked for Transforming the Foundation. Mm-hmm. And they were all trusts. So we were led to believe that this was a trust and that he was just a person that was out there doing the job and helping everybody he could possibly help within the system of corrections. I want him to pay back the money. I want him to give every cent back. Scott Guthrie says he advocates for a fairer prison system guarding against the abuse of prisoner rights and holding corrections to account. At the time he met the family, he was involved with the registered charity, the Transforming Justice Foundation. It was later deregistered. And Scott Guthrie reappeared operating under the banner of Justice for Kiwis. I arranged to interview him about his work and the conversation turned to money. Scott, I need to draw to your attention in the last few days, it's come across my desk that you have charged a Northland family $9,000 for services and they've paid you $9,000. I've seen the accounts. What are you charging them for? So the work that we do in prison, travelling up Northland, I'm down South Island based, um, travelling up to Northland, airfares, things like that, but we have to cover the cost. That's a one-off that's one off. There is no more charges. We've got to get in front of the prisoner, talk to the prisoner, visit them several times, go and visit the family, do extensive work um, looking at their case file, still waiting on their case file to come because it's going to appeal. That takes huge amount of time um, going over a trial transcript, court transcripts, etc. Hundreds of hours can go into that. Absolutely. So, so it's a business, is it, rather than advocacy? You, you're well, making a living from it. Business. It's certainly not a business, Lisa. It certainly is simply trying to cover a part of the cost that we're doing. I see on one of the invoices that they've received, and it is an invoice that you've sent the family, you're charging for sales tax as well, and the bill was for, for $10,000. I mean, uh, have you provided re- receipts for that money? Um, I would... Th- I would dispute that at all. I haven't got an invoice for $10,000. $10,000. I'm looking at an invoice sent from you to the family requesting payment of $10,000 for support and advice and consulting with corrections. Well, that would have to be totally incorrect. You'd need to send me a copy of that because I would refute that. Absolutely. Scott, are you saying that you have never sent an invoice to any family requesting funds for support and advice in dealing with corrections? Totally I'm saying that. What I'm saying is the family that you're pertaining to is... It's come from your email address. Lisa, the initial invoice was, yes, 10000 and it was was rejigged because... So you did send them an invoice for $10,000 then? uh, I think we discussed it. Look. No, Scott, this is really important. This is a vulnerable family. I have in front of me here an invoice, which is from you. It has your name, your address. It has your bank account, your cell phone contacts, and your email address on it. You billed this family for $10,000, didn't you? Absolutely. Um, Sorry, when I'm looking at my invoices now, you are correct, but that invoice was withdrawn and a new one was drawn up because $4,000 was kept aside, kept aside so we could get a psychologist report for that inmate heading towards an appeal. So how many invoices are you looking at, Scott, when you say, you know, when you look at your invoices, yes, 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 oh, actually, I did send that invoice. I mean, how many times have you invoiced them? Um, that particular family, I'm looking at three invoices now. The, the original one was withdrawn and then there was two more. So what was the total you were wanting from them for your support and advice and consulting with corrections? Well, total, um, it's negotiable. Who can afford what? We've got to work out how many hours that we put into these particular families' cases. Sorry, I beg your pardon, Scott. Who can? It depends on who can afford what. Can some families that you're charging afford more than the ten thousand that you build no, this family it's for? Not what it's about. You've got to work out the time that you're going to put into these families and the time that you're going to spend doing it. So you are charging families for your advocacy and support and advice. Sometimes yes. 
How many families have you billed and been paid by? Uh, two or three at the, at the moment. You're presenting yourself as someone who is doing this work out of goodwill and wanting to support people, but you're actually billing vulnerable families. And I'm just wondering, what have you delivered to this family for the money? And they have paid you, from the bank transfers that I can see, more than $9,000, Scott. So what have you done for them? Well, that's not correct. So what we've done for them is this... Start- Hang on, no, let's just go back, because it's important. The detail's important. I'm looking at transfers into your account for $1,255, $1,000, $800, and um, $6,000. And yes, by right. a rough calculation, that takes us to $9,058. So what did yes. they get for that, Scott? Well, I've been up to see that family three times in, on, in Kaikoua, yes. And I've worked That's a lot of them. money for three sets of airfares. Hang on, Lisa, just hang on. That's also the time that I've spent with their son in prison, the hours that I've spent talking to corrections um, officials about getting him out of segregation, getting him placement, the work that I'm doing with, with um, the um, appeal lawyer, arranging going to court hearings when he was sentenced, writing letters about the judge, the horrific way that the judge treated the family and his mother at that sentencing, writing letters for them so they can write back to the judge and put a complaint in about that judge. They don't understand the law. The way that that family was treated by the by the judicial system was disgusting. The way that that prison inmate was pre- treated by the prison system was disgusting. So I'm just wanting to be clear here because the way that uh, we're told you present is that the advocacy is um, out of, well, the goodness of your heart, that it's charitable work. Yet, on the other hand, you're billing these families. You write at the top of these sheets that they are invoices. So you, you're, you're charging for this work. Are Lisa, you being upfront where, about that, Scott? Lisa, where has it ever been said that JFK is charitable? It is not charitable. It is not registered. We have never made that statement. Okay. We do as much as we can, but any group has to have funds to be able to do what they do because the government won't do what they do. Okay, I just want to take you back to your initial invoices to this family, which were, you mentioned Charitable Trust. You were part of the Transforming Justice Foundation, which was a registered charitable trust, wasn't it, Scott? Right, okay. When you sent the initial invoice to them, you included an email address which had Transforming Justice in, in the email. So you were giving the impression that this was coming from transforming justice, weren't you? By at the time, at the time when I first engaged with that family, it was coming from transforming justice. Yes, that's correct. Okay, so did the money go that they paid into the transforming justice trust fund, or did it go uh, into no. your private account, Scott? No, because the board actually used it. We use that as uh, travel costs and disbursements. Uh, I'm and looking got... at the bank account here. Mm, I can read it out if and you I've... want me to. But is that read your bank? Is that minutes. your bank account, Scott? Lisa, it, I have got minutes from the board. That Cooperative used, Bank? I have got minutes from the board that we use those funds simply for travel disbursements. Can Except, you please clarify for me, Scott, whose bank account did this money go into? Was it your private bank account? Correct. So you sent them an invoice, including transforming justice information at the base of the invoice, yet the money was going into your bank account, even though, well, it kind of gives the distinct impression that you were operating for a charitable trust. Do you see a problem with that? Um, I can see where you, what you're pertaining to, Lisa, but yeah, we're off. Right, and when you sent them an invoice, um, another invoice, you also uh, included that same Transforming Justice email address o- on that account as well. Again, arguably giving them the impression you were working for a charitable trust. So again, I'm assuming, did that go into your personal bank account too? Uh, yes, it would have. Correct. And again, Scott, do you see a problem with this? I can see what you're pertaining to, Lisa, but yep. yep. Are you going to give this money back to this family? Well, I'll certainly have a discussion with them, and if, they, if, if that's what they want, absolutely no They problem. want the money back, Scott. Are you going to give it back to them? I've got no issue with that, Lisa. So you will pay back $9,058 to this family, which is what they have paid you so far? I've got no issue with that at all. And if any of the other families that you work with want their money back, are you going to give that back too? Yeah, absolutely. 
Scott Guthrie there. In June this year, Corrections granted Scott Guthrie what's called specified visitor status, meaning he could go into jails, help inmates get ready for release and parole hearings. But the law bans visitors of this kind taking any money or reward on or from or on behalf of any inmate. So the department's now suspended Scott Guthrie's visitor status pending the outcome of an investigation. And in a statement, Corrections National Commissioner Rachel Liotta says families should not have difficulties engaging with corrections. We have an obligation to be accessible and responsive. And she is encouraging any families who have worked with this individual to contact corrections at info at corrections.gov.nz that email address again info at corrections.gov.nz and she says she will contact them personally and work with them to resolve any issues they have experienced engaging with corrections and we'll have more from the family involved after six it is 20 past five and you're with Checkpoints on RNZ National Kia ora rawatu mo te whakarongo mai e haere aki nei we will speak to the Associate Health Minister Penny Henare Nearly a week since their launch, Auckland's shiny new vaccination buses have given the shot to just over 400 people. But several of the promised buses are yet to hit the road. Checkpoint went in search of the Auckland buses called Shop Bro. Uh, the going appeared slow in some spots, but those behind the wheel say the buses are helping. Our reporter Nick Trubridge and cameraman Nick Munro have the story. <laughs> They were launched to much fanfare, touted as a key cog in the Auckland vaccination rollout. Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern says six buses are up and running across Tāmaki Makaurau. They're in the Auckland region and they are being utilised specifically by our Māori and Pacific providers um, who are um, using the data they have available to them to identify areas where we need to um, increase vaccine uptake. Except she's not quite correct. Four buses opened their doors to the Auckland public today. A fifth was at a closed event at NZ Post, and we're told a sixth will be relaunched tomorrow. So we dropped into one of those buses that is open to the public. First stop, Alfriston College's gym, where when we arrive just one person is in the post-jab observation area. But site lead Juanita To'o Crichton says the buses are making a difference in these pockets of Auckland. Uh, been really good. Um, we started at nine and we, uh, we have um, quite a few parents and their children that come in. So yeah, we, uh, we had a bit of a busy hour in the morning. <laughs> In Clendon, Manureba Marae's bus, restyled Shotcuz, has pulled up at the local pack and save. A trickle of Aucklanders roll up to the registration tent, their attention diverted as they walk and drive into the supermarket car park for a weekly shop. It's all about taking Pfizer to Fano, family and friends. This is what our community wanted and our community was saying you need to bring vaccinations to the people. You need to come out, come out of a, a you know, of a, a clinical setting, or come out of a, um, out of a marae environment, and come and come out to our community. Manurewa Marae Chief Executive Takutai Moana Natasha Kemp says she's been trying to arrange this for at least a year. About 100 people have had the jab on day one at Clendon Pack and Save, but Natasha Kemp says it's not all about the numbers. I said this morning that um, this isn't a numbers game for us, this is about equity. This is about increasing engagement um, in a community setting for our whanau to come out and get vaccinated. And right next door to Clendon Park Pack and Save are the Golden Arches, McDonald's, opening tomorrow under Level 3. No doubt there'll be plenty of Aucklanders driving through, so would you like a side of Pfizer with that? Auckland councillor and self-confessed KFC lover Josephine Bartley says Auckland's Kentucky Frieds are the perfect place to park these vaccine buses. It's a win-win, like you've got a captive audience right there that will be waiting for hours that will be happy because they're going to get KFC at the end of it when they finally get through that drive through So why wouldn't you use the opportunity to vaccinate while people are already in their cars? We haven't heard of any plans to stop in on the Colonel yet, but Councillor Bartley's adamant fries and Pfizer create a combo too tasty to pass up. This is a perfect opportunity, but it's only a short window that we have to do something. So I really hope KFC comes to the party 
and the health providers that have got the buses. I hope everybody sees this as an opportunity to actually get the vaccination rates up. A Northern Region Health spokeswoman told Checkpoint three buses were operating before today when one run by Huakina Trust in Pukekohe was added before the fifth at Clendon Park Pack and Save hit the road today. Six will be on the road tomorrow with Ngāti Whātua Orake beginning visits in Orake. It's hoped the remaining six buses will be in service by the end of next week. It is 24 minutes past five. Kia mō tonu mai. You're listening to Checkpoint on RNZ National. Auckland builders are being told to plan carefully to avoid chaos when they return to work tomorrow. Most sites are expected to reopen at Level 3, but straight away they'll face what other firms all around the country are struggling with, the squeeze on materials. Phil Pennington reports. Todd Wickenden of Broswick Builders has seven projects to kickstart back to life. He's been rushing around making sure his workers all have masks, sanitizer, and know the reopening rules. The um, phone hasn't really stopped, you know, with organising subcontractors calling, clients all calling and pretty excited to get back to work. But yeah, managing it's going to be just a, another another thing though, isn't it? It's, it's not the easiest thing to manage. Construction Health and Safety NZ says trades need to be talking to each other now so they're not falling over each other tomorrow. Its chief executive is Chris Alderson. One of the things that probably worries us a little bit is you know, the keenness to get back on site, particularly for a small residential site, is that all the trades turn up on the first day and, and there's a bit of chaos. And I think you know if people sit back and just plan a little bit about who's going to be there, you know, we haven't eliminated COVID and we certainly don't want to have any problems from you know, people turning up with a total lack of any protocols or controls. Builders may be gagging to get back, but warned those controls will hold them back a bit. Tony Castledine is from MyTech, which most merchants rely on for steel plate to make frames and trusses. He says there's a lot of catching up to do. We finished up prior to lockdown with a container sitting in our yard here in Auckland ready to go down Christchurch, but it missed that cut-off. So, yeah, we're coming back to, I don't know, just over 200 tonne of backlog. Castle Dine is arranging how to get 65 or so plate makers and distribution staff back into their Auckland factory. He's contacted all the big chains to say orders will be filled in strict order. There'll be no queue jumping, there'll be no customer collects. But builders in Level 2 areas are already seeing queue jumping as merchants juggle short supplies. Jamie Coleman in Wellington had ordered some plasterboard, then got a surprise. When I went to go pick it up and they'd already pre-sold it to someone else, they ended up pinching what I had off someone else's order. And I was thinking, shit, this is getting really bloody cutthroat. The guy was like, oh, well, you've got what you want, I don't know what your problem is. I was like, mate, I'm not a huge fan of taking this other guy's stuff. Obviously, yes, I'm going to do it because you're offering it to me, but... I feel horrible about doing that. He says another plasterboard order has come through quickly, so signs are improving and he's able to keep his seven workers busy. The Building Industry Federation's Julian Lays says not all the workers at warehouses and manufacturers can come back at Level 3. We're looking initially probably at about 50% with social distancing and all the other safety measures in place. We won't get to figures around 80% until really we get into Level 2. His federation is now working on giving advice to the government about improving the supply chain in case of another lockdown, something that Tony Castledine of MyTech says is vital. The scrambled restart by builders and staggered restart by suppliers will cause delays into next year. Todd Wickenden of Broswick Builders says buyers hoping to spend Christmas Day in their new home might just have to think again. Those Christmas dates is for moving are going to be very hard to hit now. Suppliers expect it to take 10 to 14 days just to clear the backlog of pre-COVID material orders, even as new orders flood in. Homai or Fakaro, we'd love your feedback on anything you've heard on the programme this evening. Nō reira ānei nā kaupapa mō te hōtaka nei. Let me know your thoughts on tougher penalties for people who breached the COVID rules, going from a few hundred dollars, about 300 bucks, right up to $12,000 now. Um, and also, what incentives could we use to encourage more people to be vaccinated? Pātui mai, text me, 2101, tweet us at Checkpoint RNZ or send us an email, checkpoints at rnz.co.nz.
In an effort to boost vaccination rates, the Taranaki District Health Board is adding a bit of sizzle to make getting a jab a bit more appetising. Tomorrow morning, anyone who turns up for a shot at its new Plymouth clinic between 7 and 9 will be treated to a bacon butty for their trouble. Our Taranaki Whanganui reporter Robin Martin has more. That's the sound which Taranaki is hoping will help turn around the lowest vaccination rate in the country. As of September the 14th, only 28% of the eligible population was fully vaccinated, while 61% had had at least one shot. A mass vaccination event at the New Plymouth Raceway over the weekend delivered only 342 jabs when it had been hoped to give 2,000. Bevan Clayton-Smith heads up the region's vaccination programme. He says those stats are not the motivation behind the bacon buddies, but if they help get people vaccinated, that's all good with him. We've got a clever bunch of people working in this group and I guess it's just generating a whole range of initiatives and ideas to A, um, look at how we can uh, maximise every opportunity for people to get vaccinated, to provide that opportunity and to maximise you know, um, what we can offer in terms of protecting against COVID and the Delta variant. Mr Clayton Smith says they're going the whole hog. I think we've got up to 120, 150 mouths to feed if we need to and we'll take it from there and look, it might be a case of buns on the run, you just never know where the bacon buddy might end up next week or the week after. We're just going to trial it and see how it goes, you know, no idea, we're going to explore everything we can do to ensure that we've got good coverage across Taranaki. And if bacon's not your thing, don't worry, the cupboards aren't bare yet. That may not be everybody's taste, so what's coming up will be a smorgasbord of ideas and initiatives until the end of the year, so then we can maximise every opportunity. So there's more to come, we've got plenty more in the pantry, and this is our bread and butter, so we know what we're doing. The aroma of bacon piqued the interest of most people on Devon Street. I think it's a pretty sweet deal. Get in there, get it done. As long as it's gluten free, I'll be there. I don't think it's the right incentive, it should be something a bit healthier. Oh, Bacon Buddy sold me on there. I think everybody should go without needing free anything. Bacon Buddies are good. Just need a little push to go get the vaccination. Especially since you don't have to book an appointment, makes it much easier. Good start to the day. I kind of want to diet, but... Yeah, as a vegetarian, it doesn't bother me too much, mate. But spare a thought for Mark Simpson, who turned up for his pre-booked vaccination today, sans Bacon Buddy. Oh, that's OK, mate. This was booked six, months, uh, six weeks ago, so, you know, is what it is. I wouldn't mind one now, though, because I haven't had lunch. As part of its efforts to bring the vaccine to the people, the Taranaki District Health Board's Rural Outreach Team is beginning a round-the-mountain tour next week. Its mobile clinic will visit Whangamomana in East Taranaki on Monday and complete a 14-stop circuit at Mimi in the north on November the 30th. And that was Robin Martin and Bacon Buddies, eh? What do you make of that as an incentive? Checkpoint. The Associate Minister of Health, Pene Henare, joins us live to talk penalties for COVID rule busters and how to boost Māori vaccination rates. We're joined by a family hit by the Delta virus and the Godwits are back. Homai or Fakaro, we'd love your feedback on anything you've heard on the programme this evening, whether it's bacon butties or COVID penalty fines. Don't forget, you can text us on 2101, you can tweet us at Checkpoint RNZ or you can flick us an email. The address is checkpoint at rnz.co.nz. It is time now for the headlines. Ane a Sarah mena pita pita kōrero. Kia ora, Lisa. RNZ News Headlines, ko Sarah Thompson tōko ingoa. Corrections has launched an investigation and suspended the visit of privileges of a self-styled justice reformer following allegations he charged an inmate's family thousands of dollars for support and advice in dealing with the department. The man says he advocates for a fairer prison system, guarding against the abuse of prisoner rights and holding corrections to account. He told Checkpoint that all he is doing is covering the costs he incurs in travelling to prisons to meet inmates and to review files and advocate on their behalf. Half. The Prime Minister is urging Auckland to push on to reach 90% of the eligible population vaccinated against COVID-19 within the next fortnight. The region comes out of lockdown later tonight and will be at alert level three for at least two weeks. Jacinda Ardern says 79% of Aucklanders have had at least one jab and with the lockdown ending she is urging people to keep up the pace. She says the vaccinations will provide additional protection not just for themselves but for their colleagues as they return to work in the future. 
More than 400 people have been tested today at two pop-up centres in Upper Hauraki on the Firth of Thames. 300 people have been swabbed today at Farekawa Marae near Kaiowa and 105 at the Mangatangi Marae. The region is now designated to be in Level 4 lockdown until Friday following the discovery of four community cases in the area. And finally, the government is working to reduce the size of a contingent travelling to Scotland in November for a climate change conference, being described as the most important since the Paris Agreement was adopted in 2015. The Climate Change Minister, James Shaw, will be among the 12 strong group attending the conference, although some are based overseas. The people returning to New Zealand will be given special managed isolation allocations upon their return and will not affect the number of spaces available for emergency cases. Those are your headlines. Our next news and sport update is at six. Nā mihi, Sarah. No mai, hoki mai. If you're just joining us, this is Checkpoint. Ko Lisa Owen tēne. Ko taku hoa e nai nai, ko Nona Peltier, who is here, of course, to talk business. Let's start. Um, Kiwi property Nona is planning to build the country's first major builds to rent development. Yeah, so how does that work? What are the details? Yeah, it's a 295-unit apartment complex. It's going to be in the precinct known as Sylvia Park. That's a very large retail mall uh, in Auckland. And and it's going to be part of a mixed retail office development. Uh, there's going to be um, rail through there as well. This type of accommodation is quite common overseas. We haven't seen a lot of it here in New Zealand. Nothing as big as this for sure. It's a $221 million project. And so it would be Kiwi Property being the landlord offering up this accommodation uh, to people uh, with with full, you know, uh, long-term tenancy. That's one of the big attractions of this type of of property, people don't have to move at the whim of, say, you know, a person who owns a unit decides to sell and what have you. This is like in a building that's built for tenants long term, and uh, yeah. So uh, that's not the only one they've got on the on the plan. They've got another one. They've applied for resource consent. That's a twenty five story building that they're planning to build. They've applied for consent at Lynn Mall property, and that would be a two hundred and forty five unit building. And Nona, um, speaking of sort of property investment, the possible collapse of a Hong Kong property investment firm has really upset the global markets and New Zealand, it seems, isn't immune. So what's been going on there? Yeah, so it's a company uh, called China Evergrande Group. It's, you know, maybe you've never heard of it, but hey, they have about $305 billion, that's US dollars, of debt that they are perhaps struggling to repay. And um, there's real serious concern that this company could go under. And if it does, the ramifications would be immense. So Stride, which is a local uh, property investor, it had a brilliant plan last week to spin off of it, its office uh, portfolio. So it's a diversified uh, investor. They have retail and industrial and uh, big box retail. And as well, they have these uh, office buildings. And they were going to sh- you know, list them in a company called Fabric. Well, today they pulled the plug on that because of the volatility that's happening in the markets. They just uh, said they can't price their properties properly in these conditions. And so uh, that's what's happened there. So, But they have till March to settle, make, you know, perhaps put this back on the table. Well, time will tell how things uh, shake out. But for now, certainly the markets are really uh, volatile. And speaking of the markets, Nona, let's take a trot through the numbers. Yeah, so the local top 50 index, today it fell barely two points. I mean, not quite two, to 13,177. And that was despite all that volatility, uh, you know, in Hong Kong and the Asian markets. The dollar is also steady against the U.S. at 70.2 U.S. cents, slips slightly against the Australian at 96.6 and 51.4 pence. Thanks, Nona Kakite. That is Nona Peltier with our business news. Nationals leader Judith Collins says she will never resign from her position, even if the party's support sinks below 20%. The declaration comes as dissatisfaction at her performance grows in the caucus, with two recent polls registering a dismal result. Anaite Kairi Poata, a Craig McCulloch, our deputy political editor. 
Judith Collins has a message for her colleagues today as more make their way back to Parliament. My message is very clear. Keep focused on the things that matter to New Zealanders. The comment may stick in her colleagues' craw, given Judith Collins' distinct lack of focus of late and a series of gaffes. Most recently, she and her deputy, Shane Retty, admitted getting the COVID-19 rules wrong while in Queenstown after being filmed ordering at a cafe without wearing a mask. The rules around Level 2 have been very unclear, but... We would do it differently and certainly it is important I could have kept my mask on for another one or two minutes. We'll certainly do it different next time. The offence is a trivial one and would likely have gone without remark if not for the leader's recent attack on the scientist Susie Wiles for visiting a friend at a beach without wearing a mask. Well, I think she's a big, fat hypocrite, actually. The irony has not gone unnoticed. The mishap adds to a shocker few weeks for Collins. There was that breakfast television interview. You have a portfolio of Pacific people. It was a yes or no question. It was just Her former chief press sec speaking out on a spin-off podcast. She prizes loyalty above all else, but then her ugly stepsister paranoia steps in. And then two terrible polls. The worst came from close to home last week, with National's own pollster, Curia, putting its support at just 21.3%. I do not worry about things like polls, because polls go up and down, and most pollsters would refuse to poll during a Level 4 lockdown. She maybe should be worried. Some of her colleagues have told RNZ they are deeply unhappy with Judith Collins' recent performance. They want change. And look who it is, back at Parliament for the first time since lockdown. Long hair blowing in the wind. You know, there's been some negative polls. I think National has to own those polls. But I don't think we should be overreacting. Yes, it's Simon Bridges, former leader, potential comeback kid. MPs have been shopping around his name as a potential replacement, despite his public protestations. I'm not seeking the leadership of the National Party. I can't be clear as- For now, Bridges looks to be the only alternative being considered by caucus. All signs are that Christopher Luxon, often touted as a future leader, is biding his time. Here he is on TVNZ's Q&A programme on Sunday. I'm just one of those people who's built my career on focusing on the job that I've got now, playing the role that I'm asked to in the team, and that's what I'm going to do. But there's a lot of learning to do. You know, That's really why I think you know I've got to focus on that for now. For now, that leaves the ball in Simon Bridges' court and the wider caucus. If they were hoping Collins would make it easy for them, they're mistaken. Judith Collins says no matter how low the polls go, she will not resign the leadership. I feel very secure in it. She has time on her side. While Auckland remains at level three and much of the caucus in lockdown, any action remains on hold. But the standoff can only last so long. Collins will be hoping her colleague's focus does not settle on her. It is 20 to 6. I'm Lisa Owen and you're with Checkpoints on RNZ National. Hey, muriaki ina pita pita kōrero. After the news at 6, the family warning people to stay away from a self-styled justice campaigner who charged them thousands of dollars. The government's warning people breaking COVID rules will cost them as it increases the penalties people may be forced to pay. The courts will now be able to sting people up to $12,000 for breaching the rules. The government says the previous penalties of between $300 and $1,000 did not reflect the severity of the breaches. And the government's also announced a $38 million funding boost for Māori health providers to help increase COVID vaccination rates among Māori. Ko taku manuhiri and I and I ko Penny Henere, the Associate Health Minister, who joins me now, Tēnā koe e te minita. Kia ora. Can you tell us how many Māori are fully vaccinated now? Uh, so right now we've just hit 25.4% off the top of my head of eligible Māori um, 12 years and older who have received both doses of the vaccination. And how does that compare with um, fully vaccinated non-Māori? Uh, it doesn't compare well at all, um, and I'll be brutally upfront about that. We know that the rates are lagging behind. We've seen huge uptake over the past six weeks, unsurprisingly, because of Delta and the alert levels that we've found ourselves. Um, but, you know, we're encouraged that the numbers are picking up, and we're going to do everything we can to make sure they continue to rise. Why have you left your run so late? You know, because we're months into this campaign and we know that Māori uh, lag behind in so many health statistics. Why didn't you get ahead of this? 
Oh, we did, actually. We announced at the well, beginning the of the year. Well, the figures suggest not, Minister. We, we announced at the beginning of the year to support the push for Māori vaccination. And one of the biggest challenges we had was to build the infrastructure in the Māori health provider network that reaches and serves these communities. Of course, the numbers I'm not happy with. Uh, but I know that the Māori health providers right now are continuing to work really hard and will continue to do so, and we're here to support them to do that. So opening up Auckland to level three when Māori vaccination rates are so low compared to um, the rest of the population, are you OK with that? Because that opens them up to a greater risk. Uh, I am OK with that. And the decision that Cabinet made yesterday uh, was a calculated one that would allow us to continue to push testing and vaccination through alert level three. We've managed COVID in the past through alert level three. And we know, of course, that the rules that alert level three mean that uh, Fano and Tamaki Makoto can't travel into other regions and travel should still be limited, which is why we continue to ask our Fano and communities of Auckland to continue to abide by the rules. But you would accept, would you, that it's a calculated risk that is a higher risk for Māori given their low vaccination rates? Yes, I accept that. And you are prepared to take that risk for your people? Look, we've spoken to the Māori health providers and, you know, for example, if we take Manurewa Marae, when they first set up their particular service off the Marae in June, we supported them to do that. And despite having a specific Māori approach, we were still only seeing fewer than 20% of Māori fronting to receive the vaccine. Large numbers were coming through the doors, but they weren't Māori. So we've had to adapt our approach alongside Māori health providers to get Māori to come forward, in particular in Tāmaki Makoto. And, you know, today Manurewa Marae, for example, is now driving one of the buses that's out to make sure our people have access to the vaccine. And that is great, Minister, but here's the point, right? As I said, Māori are disadvantaged in the health system, poorer stats. You must have known that all along and anticipated that that would be reflected in vaccination rates, right? The age-based rollout that the government first approved arguably was always going to leave Māori behind with such a large number of young people in the Māori population. Why did you support that rollout in the first place, given those factors? If we have a look at the rollout and the start of it, we, we always said that the first focus would be our komatu akuya. We didn't set an age ban for the Māori there. We, we worked with Māori health providers. We enabled them to service komatu akuya and to service whānau. So if I went in with my family who were eligible, they were able to be vaccinated when they got there. And that's what did happen at the beginning of the year. As we come to the other age bands, and what we had to do was build the infrastructure so that they could supply more, knowing full well that our uh, Māori population find themselves in the younger uh, age bands, we needed those Māori health providers to have the infrastructure to be able to deliver to the mass numbers that we need to. We're seeing that now. Do I wish that they were better? Of course. We're going to continue to support and make sure that they rise. Let's move on to this prisoner, right? The person who was bailed and then turned out to have COVID. So travelled from Auckland down to the um, Miranda area. How many people were in the car with him? Um, I understand. I, look, I, I understand there were people in the car with them. The Prime Minister today um, didn't want to talk about who, were, who was in the car. No, but we just know, numbers. We know, just we numbers. Know I understand there was possibly four. Right, because the court order said one person could pick him up. So... The rules were broken. That's right. And the Prime Minister and the one team stand up today said that first our approach is health and we're making sure that we're contact tracing uh, and testing these people. And secondly, of course, we'll start to investigate why these rules were broken and more importantly, how we might fix them. She indicated today, the Prime Minister, that uh, the Minister for um, uh, Ministers Davis and Williams, if I recall correctly, for police and for corrections would have to look into how we get a better system to make sure that these kinds of things don't happen. OK, I'm just wanting to try and establish the facts at the moment. So they made multiple stops on, on the way to the bail address, four apparently. Where did they go? Uh, look, um, the first announcement was that they went to um, a place in Mount Albert and Mangere. So there's a two. Uh, the investigations are still... Private underway. houses, Minister? Pardon, sorry? Were they private houses or how would you characterise the places? That's not how I have it. It's, I've only got it as uh, 
stopped in Mount Albert in my head. That's the only information I have. That's why the investigation is important. What we do know is uh, that the other two sites, that's where the investigations are continuing at the moment, and I'm sure there'll be more detail on that um, in the coming hours. Are there going to be any legal consequences for this person? Look, me, I, 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 I expect that as we investigate and we see whether or not there were rules broken here, you know, we've got to come down firm on these things. And you will, you mentioned earlier uh, the fine regime that was announced today. Uh, in order to deter that kind of rule breaking, it might sound innocent for some, but for the stakes of our community and COVID spread, we just can't have that. So, Do you reckon the rules are going to be a deterrent, Minister? Because here's the thing, right? This person was released um, on bail. They were set some very strict conditions. They were told to go straight to their bail address, no unnecessary stops. We now find out there were four. The court says you can be picked up by one approved person. You've told me there were four people in the car. So p- some people just simply do not care, Minister. So do you think increasing the fine is going to help? Well, the second one I also said too was that the Prime Minister made it clear that the ministers who's in, whose departments were involved are going to have to work out why this happened and how do we fix it. That's a, that's a very important thing to do so that this doesn't happen again. You will already know too that the fine regime that the Minister and Prime Minister announced today isn't going to be uh, coming into effect till November. So we've got a job also to be able to continue to uh, make sure we explain the rules clearly to the whānau out there so that they don't breach them. In respect of this particular person, you said there were probably four people in the car. Did they they pick people up along the way? Uh, I don't know that. So you don't know? The the only things that I do have um, in terms of the information given to me by the officials is that there were... Two confirmed stops, one in Mahe, one in Mount Albert, and then further investigations underway. OK, appreciate your time, Minister. That is the Associate Health Minister, Penny Henere, there. It's not just Netflix Aucklanders have been eyeballing over lockdown. There's been a rush on for e-books as well. In fact, the weekly demand for online e-books almost doubled in Auckland libraries during Level 4. Meanwhile, it's good news for book lovers in Level 3. Bookstores are finally able to send out piles of paperbacks. Louise Tanous reports. A few hundred. Uh, It's probably going to take me a few days to get them all out the door, the ones that have been ordered so far, but yeah, I'll go for it. (laughs) It's all hands on deck at Jason Books and the CBD as they're finally able to get back to some sort of business. Maud Cahill is in the shop tackling the piles of books ordered over lockdown, but she admits it's nothing compared to what they'd usually sell over five weeks. It's a very small part of our turnover since we have a, a store in the city and usually most of our turnover is from people who come in. At Dorothy Butler's children's bookshop on Jervis Road in Ponsonby, owner Helen's tackling her own pile of books, ready to send out to customers tomorrow. They're setting up for click and collect with slightly reduced work hours and staffing on the cards. To combat the courier backlog, they're going the extra mile for local customers. Yeah, me me and my sister both have e-bikes. It's quite easy for us to get around on our e-bikes and around this local neighbourhood. You know, I mean, we can't do far afield. While they couldn't send books out in Level 4, they found other ways to support parents and teachers. Just gave them a few things to do. So, like, we had a video book review um, challenge, so they had to do a book review of a book that they bought from our shop with our sticker on the back and we also had a haiku competition got lots of response from parents and also teachers i have had feedback from people so they appreciate having you know more ideas Auckland libraries have also seen a rush on books from afar. Head of Library and Learning Services at Auckland Council, Catherine Leonard, says e-collection demand has been huge. She says families were quick to act. The day that the lockdown was announced, we saw a jump even before Auckland was in lockdown or the whole country went into level four, about a 22% increase. Aucklanders kind of seem to grab the opportunity to get some distractions for children or themselves quite quickly. While online children's books in particular have doubled in demand, it's the top two adult genres on trend of escapism or self-help, she says, is telling. Just wanting to get our heads out of the lockdown mentality, but also thinking a bit about how you deal with some of the aspects that that lockdown bring with it, you know, some of that sort of self-analysis and taking a bit of care of ourselves. I think they they seem to be the, the two that Aucklanders swing between. 
Library data also shows a peak in weekend web traffic for e-books, a sign of Aucklanders' efforts to differentiate between the days in lockdown and take time to relax. And in case you're wondering, any physical books at home won't be overdue, just return them in level two. A family is sleeping in their own beds tonight, fresh from a stint in quarantine after contracting COVID-19. Vanessa Goodson went into quarantine in Auckland when her five-year-old daughter caught COVID. She then got it herself six days into the stay. After 16 days in the hotel, they've emerged back into the world this afternoon and Vanessa joins me now. Kia ora, Vanessa. How does it feel to be at home? Kia ora. It feels honestly amazing. I'm so happy to be home. And how was everybody doing? Your five-year-old daughter, Madeline, she was the one who tested positive yeah. first, yeah? Yes, yes. So she was our first one that tested positive. Um, she had no symptoms while we were in MIQ, and she's been such a brave girl. Um, we actually told her we were going to a holiday house. <laughs> so she didn't really realise what we were doing. She just thought we were at a hotel. <laughs> Does she, or have you found out yet where she caught it from? Uh, yes, it was um, my mother-in-law, so my gra- uh, her grandmother who was living with us at the time. Um, she contracted the virus um, first. And Vanessa, do you know where she caught it from? Uh, yes, a family member's um, household. Right, so you, yes. en- you ended up catching it as well. So, I mean, can you just explain to us what that was like? And I, um, I'm assuming it was the Delta strain? Uh, yes, yeah, so um, I went into my queue. I was still a negative case, as well as my partner Kerry. Um, and so, and I started feeling symptoms the second day I was there. Um, and yeah, so it started with like a sore throat, and then irritability. Like I was irritable, very confused, and then I suddenly just got hit with a headache that just didn't go away. And then it was basically downhill from there for a few days. Yeah, it was. Yeah, it was really. It was not a nice place to be, but I'm very happy that I battled through it. Yeah, and when you say after those initial symptoms, I mean, how long did you feel unwell for? And at its worst, how would you describe it? Um, so I so I had about four days where it was just back to back like sickness, and then I started to like feel better again on like my I don't know fifth or sixth day, but then it would hit me again and it would come back, and then I'd be sick again. So it would come in waves, and um, the worst of what it feels like, to be honest, is it felt like early trimester pregnancy symptoms of just being nauseous and um, yeah, not, not wanting to eat. Um, I lost my taste, which that was probably the worst symptom. Um, I didn't get that back for a while. Um, and, yeah, just the headache. It just wouldn't go away. It, no, like, neurofen or paracetamol would, like, help. It, was, it would just stay there. So what was it like to have to pack up for yourself and your daughter and to head off to quarantine on your own? Yeah, I fully went into mum mode. I packed about eight bags and I packed everything and everything you could imagine, including my skincare, my daughter's toys. She had like three baby borns, um, my crystals, my ring light, my work, laptop, five chargers, like everything. I just did not know how long we were going for. Um, and I, yeah, I just, I just, Really, I overpacked, but it was it was good. It helped us settle in. <laughs> so you have documented your your whole journey, your COVID journey, basically on Instagram. Now, for some people, COVID can be a bit of a taboo subject. So, can you just talk us through why you decided to share your experience with people? Um, so initially, I was very hesitant about sharing the journey just because it was still a bit of a shock. But I do have a little bit of a following on social media, and um, it, it, it's kind of like my job um, daily. So I think people were noticing that I wasn't posting and asking if I was okay. So um, after much thought, I thought I was just going to share my journey because at, at some stage, uh, like at earlier. I found myself looking, um, you know, for recovered COVID cases and uh, there wasn't much out there on social media. So I just thought, you know, I'm just going to go out there and tell everyone where I'm at, how this happened and just kind of reassure people that it's not as scary as the the thought of it. Like, you know, I I really, I, I suffer from anxiety and I overthink a lot. So I know if I was feeling anxious, I know a lot of other people are and yeah I was basically a case now so I had to make it a positive journey to get through it and I thought why not share and just see what happens and I've had a very 
positive, um, yeah, positive impact so far. So I'm, I'm glad. So straight out of quarantine into level four lockdown. Um, level four lockdown, yeah, but soon to be level three. It's like, wow, lucky for me. Well, it must feel like, um, it seem like practically freedom given um, the situation you've been in. Hey, on the lighter side, Vanessa, I hear you, um, you ordered up a particular piece of equipment while you were in quarantine. Um, yes, yeah, so on my way out um, of here, I actually left our air fryer at home. <laughs> um, and so the second day in, I bought an air fryer from Countdown. However, it did get confiscated off me um, at arrival because um, we're not allowed appliances at MI- MIQ, but I ended up pitching my case to the duty manager. And I was allowed my air fryer like on the last week. So I was like cooking up steaks pork bellies um yeah i'm i'm real stoked shout out to um holiday inn <laughs> vanessa obviously you'd had your your taste back by then uh no oh. I, I, that, that's why i got the air fryer because oh we think i think we've just lost her that was vanessa goodson who has well got out of quarantine her five-year-old daughter caught covid and she got it herself they've both been in quarantine 16 days in in the hotel and they've emerged back in the world this afternoon to level four lockdown as she says but going at 11 59 tonight in auckland to level three let's get to um some of your feedback now and a bit of it has been coming in about our earlier interview with Scott Guthrie, a sort of self-styled justice reformer, he says he holds corrections to account, but he has been billing at least one family um, thousands of dollars for what they thought was charitable work. Uh, Nigel Hampton QC has got in touch to say organisations like the Howard League do this type of work all the time for prisoners for free. True charity, says Nigel. Thanks for your feedback, Nigel. Another listener says, I invite you to pass this information on to the police. Um, there's a couple here that I can't really read out. Uh, and another person says, um, this guy's a rip-off. Prisoner Aid does this for free. On vaccine incentives, uh, this listener says, to encourage people to get fully vaccinated, there should be a government-funded lottery mm, with a house as the prize in every DHB. That's what, 20 20 houses we're talking here. Then this would help the housing crisis and the COVID crisis at the same time. That idea from Sharon. What do you reckon about that? 2101 on the text. Ahi ahi marie, RNZ News at 6. Ko Sarah Thompson, tōku ingoa. The government has announced an extra $38 million to ensure Māori health providers provide ongoing support to their communities in the COVID response. Associate Health Minister Penny Henare says the money is on top of $23 million announced early this month to help with the response. Mr Henare told Checkpoint that Māori are one of the most at-risk communities for COVID-19 and vaccination rates for Māori are behind the general population. Uh, it doesn't compare well at all, um, and I'll be brutally upfront about that. We know that the rates are lagging behind. We've seen huge uptake over the past six weeks, unsurprisingly, because of Delta and the alert levels that we've found ourselves. Um, but, you know, we're encouraged that the numbers are picking up, and we're going to do everything we can to make sure they continue to rise. He says Māori health providers know their communities and need to be funded to do so. The Director-General of Health has outlined new exemptions for those needing to travel outside of Auckland in Level 3. The region will move to Alert Level 3 at midnight for at least two weeks. People will be able to travel for tangi, funerals, or to attend to a dying relative or accompany a tūpāpaku or deceased person. Travel across the Level 3 boundary will require a health ministry exemption and will only be permitted for close relatives. Ashley Bloomfield says the exemptions will still be restrictive. It will be in limited numbers and immediate family only and will require other appropriate measures being in place, such as social distancing and the use of face coverings. And one requirement on people who are granted such exemptions is they will require a negative swab and test result within 72 hours of their travel. Dr Bloomfield says evidence will still be required for exemptions, such as a funeral notice. Fines for breaching COVID-19 restrictions will increase sharply. The maximum fine for an individual breaching restrictions will rise from $300 to $4,000. For companies, the maximum will rise to $12,000. Fines imposed by the courts are much higher, a maximum of $12,000 for individuals and $15,000 for companies. 
A special community testing centre set up in the South Auckland suburb of Clover Park has been busy this afternoon. Everyone who lives in the area is being urged to get tested regardless of whether they have symptoms. The call comes as health authorities try to rule out any undetected cases in Clover Park where there are a number of locations of interest. Those locations are centred on a group of shops on Dawson Road. People in seven other areas of interest, Mount Eden, Massey, Maangere, Favuna, Papatoitoi, Ota, and Manurewa are also being urged to get tested, even if they don't have symptoms. Protesters in Melbourne have taken over several lanes of a busy motorway as they rally against a crackdown on the construction industry. The industry has been forced to shut for the next two weeks after construction sites became a major source of transmission for COVID-19. Here's the ABC's Jess Longbottom. It started as a small protest, probably a couple of hundred people outside the CFMEU headquarters this morning at about 10am. And now it's swelled to, I'd say, probably more than 1,000 people. We've been watching them march around the city. They've been yelling chants such as F the jab, F Dan Andrews, and we've been hearing the national anthem sung as well. I've also seen a um, pro-Donald Trump flag. Hundreds of police have been present throughout the city, and as we've been going throughout the city chasing this march as well, you can see the police trying to get ahead of them. Legislation that will introduce a new offence for planning a terrorist attack is a step closer to becoming law. The counter-terrorism legislation bill passed its second reading in Parliament this afternoon. Labour and National voted for the bill and ACT and the Greens opposed it. The Justice Minister Chris Farfoy says recent events have shown terror can take many forms. The impacts of these attacks on the New Zealand community has been immense and we must do everything we can to try and prevent such events um, from happening again. Chris Farfoy says the nature of terrorism is changing and the laws need to change to respond it. It's four minutes past six. Air New Zealand is introducing more flights between Wellington and Northland to make sure the region isn't cut off by Auckland's lockdown. The airlines announced temporary flights between the capital and Whangarei to run for a week from next Wednesday. That's in addition to the Kerikeri to Wellington flights it's also running. Access to Te Taitokoro remains highly restricted while Auckland is locked down. Moving now into sports news, the Black Caps are on their way home from Dubai after their aborted tour of Pakistan. The 34-strong New Zealand team evacuated to Dubai at the weekend, citing a security threat just hours before their one-day series against Pakistan was due to get underway in Rawalpindi. A group of 24 players left for New Zealand this afternoon, with others remaining in Dubai ahead of next month's T20 World Cup. In the wake of the Black Caps' withdrawal for Pakistan, England announced its men's and women's teams won't tour there next month, further angering Pakistan Cricket Board Chairman Ramiz Raja. I'm extremely disappointed, so are the fans actually, because right now we needed England, because it's a small cricket fraternity that we have, and so in in such times we were expecting England to just be a little bit more responsive and responsible, I guess. Meanwhile, extra security has been placed around the White Ferns ahead of their must-win one day against England and Leicester after a general threat was made against New Zealand cricket. The panel overseeing the independent inquiry into cycling has been confirmed. The inquiry follows the death of Rio Olympian Olivia Podmore in August. Mike Heron, the lawyer who investigated the sport in 2018, will co-chair the inquiry alongside sports professor Sarah Lieberman. The panel also includes former rower Genevieve Mackey and former silver fern Leslie Nicholl. And that's the news. Tonight on Nights, Otaku University's Arts Fellows for 2022. A diverse bunch with lots to say. We're at the business end of our BBC true crime series, Bad Cops. The story of a US gun control squad that ended up behaving like the mob. And Tony Stamp samples new music from Lowe, Wellington singer Ma, and Britain's greatest rapper, Little Sims, on Nights with Yard and Saw. She's filling in for me, Brian Crump, after the news at seven on RNZ National.
Te reo irirangi o Aotearoa on air, online and on demand. Now the short forecast from Met Service to midnight are up on Wednesday. Northland to Taranaki, also Coromandel, Bay of Plenty, Taupo and Taumaranui. Partly cloudy with isolated showers. Rain in Northland tomorrow night, possibly becoming heavy. Taihape, Whanganui and Manawatu, also Gisborne to wider Upper. Generally fine tonight, partly cloudy tomorrow with isolated showers in the west from the afternoon. Carpeti and Wellington, cloudy periods and isolated showers tonight, occasionally raining tomorrow. Marlborough, Nelson and Buller, cloudy periods tonight with showers in Buller, periods of rain tomorrow, possibly heavy at times. Westland will see rain with some heavy and thundery falls, mainly fine tomorrow with scattered rain at night. Fjordland will see occasional showers tonight, possibly becoming thundery, isolated showers tomorrow. For Canterbury, Otago and Southland, heavy rain about the Canterbury headwaters, scattered showers elsewhere with possible thunderstorms in Otago and Southland, mainly fine tomorrow, however mostly cloudy about the Canterbury Plains with morning showers for coastal Southland. And for the Chatham Islands, cloudy periods with showers late tomorrow. That concludes the short forecast from Met Service to Midnight Harper Wednesday. It's eight minutes past six. Thanks, Sarah. No mai hoki mai. This is Checkpoint called Lisa Owen TNA. A Northland Fano is warning others off a self proclaimed justice campaigner after he billed them thousands of dollars for providing support and advice for a family member in jail, but delivered nothing, according to them. The family was concerned about their relatives' well being and conditions in prison and was referred to Scott Guthrie by someone within the jail. Scott Guthrie's previously been with other established justice reform groups, but was allegedly sacked and left under a cloud. At the time he met the family, he was involved with the registered charity, the Transforming Justice Foundation. It was later deregistered and he resurfaced under the banner Justice for Kiwis. The family believed his help was charitable, free. The family spokesperson Donna told me he started billing them for support, advice and consulting with corrections about rehabilitation, among other things. How much around about have you paid Scott Guthrie? Um, 9250 That is a lot of money. How did you pull that together? I had to um, go to the Fano and we all pulled together to come up with the money. And it wasn't easy, it was hard. So this is people's savings here? This is people's savings. We drew money at a Kiwi bank, which was re- retirement fund money. So out of the Kiwi Saver, you took it out? Yes, yes. So how did he start asking you for money? Well, basically he rang up and said, could we pay for his flights up so that he could meet with us and go in to see a family member at the prison? So we were happy to do that. And then... When he got down, when he got up here, he sat down and he discussed all the things that he can do and do for us, which we we were thrilled because we didn't know where to turn or who to ask for help. And during that time up here, he said this could cost more money. So eventually, later on, when he came up the next time, he asked again, and I said, "Well, I don't have the money." I will have to ask around again. So we asked the Fano. They said, yeah, they would come up with the money. And then he just kept ringing and ringing and ringing and saying, what's happening with the money? And I said, well, it's not my money to give. So, you know, I can't, I just can't give it like that. So he rang a particular family member. Directly? Directly, yes. He rang him directly and asked him for the money and he asked him for 10,000 and he was given six and then he asked for another 10 on top of that and we definitely said no. Were you under the impression that he was working for charity in essence, that he was campaigning and doing this out of a sense of community service and charity, or did he give you the impression it was a business? He gave me the impression that it was a charity. Um, he, he told us that he worked for Sensible Sentencing Trust. He told us he worked for Transforming the Foundation, mm-hmm. and they were all trusts. 
So we were led to believe that this was a trust and that he was just the person that was out there doing the job and helping everybody he could possibly help within the system of corrections. Do you feel that you've been deceived here? I feel I've been deceived, yes, I do. I feel absolutely gutted for my whanau. I feel gutted for the people that he says he's going to help. I just feel ripped off, to be basic. You know, you you lose your trust. What do you think should happen with the money? What do you want to happen? I want him to pay back the money. I want him to give every cent back because everything he promised has never happened. I believe there's probably other people out there that are in the same boat as us. And when you're going through the justice system and you don't know what to do, you are very vulnerable. And and the people in prison are very vulnerable. And they latch on to him because he can talk and gives you all the hope. In reality, it's all talk and no action. What would you say to anyone who has encountered him or maybe approached by him to do justice advocacy work? What do you want to say to them? I would just say, stay clear. Stay away from him. He is a dangerous person. And earlier in the program, we spoke to Scott Guthrie. He conceded he had taken money from Donna's family and money from other families. He admitted it wasn't a good look and has pledged to give the family their money back. Meanwhile, Corrections has launched an investigation and suspended Scott Guthrie's visitor privileges. Scott Guthrie had what's called specified visitor status, meaning he can go into jails and help inmates get ready for release and parole hearings. But the law bans visitors of this kind taking any money money or any reward from or on behalf of any inmate. Now you can listen to both interviews on our Checkpoint Facebook page and the RNZ website. Aucklanders should not expect their favourite cafe or restaurant to be open tomorrow as previous level threes have shown it's not worth it for some. That's from the Restaurant Association. Just over half of its members will open under level three. John Bond reports. It's been five weeks of home cooking for Aucklanders, who no doubt will be itching to flock to restaurants and fast food joints from tomorrow. It's a quick turnaround for Monsoon Poon, serving Southeast Asian cuisine in Auckland's CBD. It's co-owned by Mike Egan. We've got to get our suppliers on board and get the product coming in, the chicken, the fish, the, the beef, the lamb, the vegetables. Then we'll start prepping away and then uh, we can start serving our customers, hopefully tomorrow night. He says they probably won't break even under Level 3, but will still get the resurgence payment. But he says starting to ramp up in anticipation of Level 2 is good. And so too is giving staff some work after nothing at all for over a month. The Restaurant Association Chief Executive Marissa Bedouard says Level 3 won't work for all outlets. 57% of their members indicated they'd open. That's lower than we've seen in past Level 3s. What we take that as being as many uh, members have decided um, that they've tried it once before. In some cases, many lost more money than they would have if, it, if they had have been closed. Cafes are more likely to open than restaurants. Dining isn't quite as good on paper plates. She says some may only be able to open later in the week. That it is a glimmer of hope. You know, it's it's an opportunity for some of our for some of our businesses to get back in there and connecting with their customers um, through contactless pickup and delivery. Quite separately, funerals and tangihanga have not been able to go ahead under level four. The Funeral Directors Association President Gary Taylor says from tomorrow they can with up to ten people. And ten people really isn't enough for it to be meaningful to those families. So as much as it is a is an advantage, it is a gain, it's not big enough of a gain to make a huge difference, I think, to people's plans. He says it is difficult emotionally for people to have delayed farewelling someone for so long. Logistically, it's a challenge too. Is it starting to put an extreme amount of pressure on the funeral homes in Auckland? A lot of the funeral homes are, are using their chapel at the moment to have the deceased in their casket uh, waiting until such a time as a, a family says, yep, we're, we're going to go ahead with the funerals. Both industries say Level 2 will make it far easier to operate. 
It is 16 minutes past six and you're with Checkpoint on RNZ National. The Climate Change Minister has denied he's receiving special treatment in the MIQ system for a trip to Scotland later this year. But the Prime Minister's confirmed he's got a spot. James Shaw plans to travel to Glasgow with the delegation for climate talks in November. Opposition parties now say the trip should be scrapped to free up precious MIQ spaces for Kiwi expats desperate to get home. Our political reporter Annika Smith has more. To go or not to go? That's the big question hanging over James Shaw's head ahead of the fast-approaching United Nations Climate Change Conference in November. Act leader David Seymour says it's not a hard call. He said he doesn't want to go to COP26. I think he should take his own advice and not go to Glasgow. Nationals' Judith Collins agrees Mr Shaw should take his own advice. I would have thought James Shaw, who was so keen on Zoom Parliament and boycotted Parliament for a day, um, could be able to do a Zoom call through the Climate Change Conference. James Shaw is one of nine diplomats who will travel to Scotland for the climate negotiations in November. So far, only one of them has an MIQ space. Mr Shaw told reporters this morning officials had tried their luck to secure more spots through the mainstream lottery system yesterday. He denied asking for or receiving any special treatment. But Jacinda Ardern has now confirmed the delegation can return under a small booking allocation used for business groups with serious economic reasons for travel. David Seymour is writing the trip off as both dangerous and pointless. Let's face it, there's been 26 of these COP conferences. Uh, If the first 25 didn't solve the problem, why does he think this one will do it? And if they did, then he doesn't need to go. Either way, the sensible thing is for James Shaw uh, not to be James Offshore and not take up MIQ space that so many people very clearly desperately need. The trip will fall during a time period where thousands of Kiwi expats are trying their luck at securing an MIQ spot through the new lottery system. Opposition parties say the Glasgow trip will take up space in MIQ that should be set aside for New Zealanders desperate to get home. So what is the case for James Shaw going offshore? This conference is probably the most important since the Paris Agreement uh, and that's because the scale of what countries have put up in terms of their ambition does not yet meet the requirement for staying within 1.5 degrees of global warming. With thousands of negotiators working up to 20 hours a day in 30 different rooms, Mr Shaw says hosting a virtual conference simply isn't possible. As for David Seymour's comments, Mr Shaw is indifferent. Uh, Look, I honestly don't care what uh, David Seymour thinks. The Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern backs her climate minister's trip, saying it's well worth going. I do consider New Zealand's presence at COP to be important. Um, Yes, we're all facing a global pandemic, but climate change is the most significant threat uh, that we face for decades to come that needs a response from us now. And important negotiations happen at COP that we need to have a seat at the table around. Work to decrease the delegation size utilising offshore representatives continues. The Black Caps are on their way home from Dubai after their aborted tour of Pakistan. The 34-strong New Zealand team evacuated to Dubai at the weekend, citing a security threat just hours before their one-day series against Pakistan was due to get underway. This afternoon, a group of 24 players left for New Zealand, with others remaining in Dubai ahead of next month's T20 World Cup there. Before boarding their home flight, skipper Tom Latham described how things unfolded last Friday. It was just uh, like a normal game day. Uh, I think we were leaving uh, at 12.30 and uh, got a message on the WhatsApp group that um, a quick uh, a team meeting, so uh, everyone was sort of wondering what was up and uh, then we got told the news of uh, that we were heading home and um, interesting 24 hours um, post that post that decision but um, yeah I think obviously New Zealand Cricket Players Association for them to, to act so swiftly and to, to get us out here to Dubai was outstanding so I know the guys were very thankful for that. Tom Latham says he feels for the Pakistan side who were set to play the Black Caps in Pakistan for the first time in nearly 20 years. 
to have cricket back in their country was, uh, I guess, something they were very proud of. And I um, remember doing the, the captain's uh, run with them, uh, with, with Bubba, uh, the day before, and just seeing how happy he was to, to have international cricket and, and to have us there. Um, you know, he was obviously very excited. And I guess it was a historic moment as well for New Zealand cricket to be back there um, 18 years since since they were last there. So uh, to be part of that was going to be something special, but um, obviously things changed. In the wake of the Black Cap cancer camp the Black Caps cancelling their tour, England have decided not to send their men's and women's teams to Pakistan next month. A decision Pakistan Cricket Board Chairman Ramaz Raja has labelled absurd. I'm extremely disappointed, so are the fans actually, because right now we needed England, because it's a small cricket fraternity that we have, and so in, in such times we were expecting England to just be a little bit more responsive and responsible, I guess. And that's Pakistan Cricket Chairman Ramaz Raja. The search for the fiancé of Florida woman Gabby Petito intensifies tonight after what are believed to be her remains were discovered in Wyoming. She'd been missing since going on a cross-country road trip with Brian Laundrie and police are now trying to track him down. CNN's Leila Santiago reports. Tonight, the investigation into Brian Laundrie's disappearance deepening as the FBI pulls evidence from his home. His parents also question being escorted in and out of their home as agents executed a search warrant. The search coming a day after tragic news out of Wyoming. Earlier today, human remains were discovered, consistent with the description of Gabrielle Gabby Petito. Full forensic identification has not been completed to confirm 100% that we found Gabby, but her family has been notified of this discovery. Last night, Laundrie's sister Cassie told ABC News Gabby was close with her son, saying Gabby was a fun and loving influence to the boys, as she always referred to them. We will cherish all the time spent with her. Investigators are still searching for Brian Laundrie, who returned to his family's Florida home without his fiance earlier this month. Over the weekend, police searched a nearby nature reserve after Laundrie's parents reported him missing on Friday. Police say, claiming the last time they saw him was three days earlier as he was headed to the reserve. But this morning, the police tell CNN they exhausted all possible avenues at the Carlton Reserve, tweeting, quote, our search of the Carlton has concluded for the evening, nothing to report. New video showing the white van Petito and Laundry were believed to be traveling in was posted to YouTube by a couple who say they spotted it in the evening of August 27th in the Bridger Teton National Forest in Wyoming, same area where the body was found. In the video, the couple says they saw the Florida tags, thought about stopping to say hello since they're also from Florida, but that the van was completely dark and looked abandoned. Petito and Laundry began their road trip in June, exploring the American West for the summer while posting photos and stories to their social media pages. Those posts abruptly stopped in late August, and Laundry returned to his home in Northport, Florida with their van, but without Petito on September 1st. Petito's father, Joseph Petito, tweeting a picture of Gabby Sunday evening saying, she touched the world. After a mammoth journey with non-stop flying for more than eight days, flocks of eastern bar-tailed godwits are finally arriving at the top of the South Island. The birds have travelled more than 10,000 kilometres from Alaska to reach our shores, and they're being warmly welcomed by Nelsonians. Samantha G has more. Gathered on the Motueka Sandspit near high tide, more than 1,000 godwits are resting beaks tucked into their wings as they recover from their long journey. Across in Nelson, cathedral bells ring out across the city to celebrate the birds' arrival. Dean Graham O'Brien says the borders might be shut, but it's wonderful to be able to welcome the birds home. For us, it's a reminder that we are heading into spring, um, the season of new life, and celebrate the wonder of God's creation with these birds flying literally around the world to be with us for summer. Cathedral staff read a prayer, which gives thanks for Kiwi, Sparrow, Tui and Hawk, adding Godwit to the verse. It's called Benedicite Aotearoa, so it's a a prayer that celebrates uh, our life here in Aotearoa, New Zealand. Um, All aspects of life, including the, the natural abundance that we have here, the people and all that people do 
Um, it's just a nice prayer to celebrate, I suppose, this time as we welcome the Godwits. Each year, thousands of bar-tailed godwits undertake a long journey to return to their feeding grounds along New Zealand's coastline. Standing on the sandspit, Birds New Zealand Nelson Regional Representative Paul Griffiths says the godwits arriving in Motueka is a marvellous sight. I think they're having a bit of a rest on the beach. Yeah, they've come for their holiday, they've flown for 12 days non-stop. Who can... Uh, who can be begrudge them a good rest on the beach in Mosueka? And they look as if, they look quite tired actually. The Godwits have banded dotterels, Caspian terns and oyster catchers for company on the sandspit. They are also joined by ruddy turnstones, wading birds that also make the long journey from their Arctic breeding grounds to New Zealand's shores, but stop along the way. Mosueka sandspit is a wonderful uh, bird reserve and nature conservation area on the edge of Motueka and it's become home to the Godwits um, or a portion of the Godwits up to a thousand birds. Ornithologist David Melville says Godwit numbers in Nelson Haven and on the Motueka sandspit are steadily increasing as more birds arrive from Alaska. I think it's important that we do welcome the Godwits home because they are actually New Zealand birds that we lend to the rest of the planet. They, in, in the course of a year, they spend more time in New Zealand than they spend anywhere else. He says the birds look utterly shattered. Several of them have been seen with their wings looking a bit droopy, and this is what happens when the birds have been flying for 12,000 kilometres and eight or nine days and nights continuous flying. By the time they get here, they're pretty exhausted, to say the least of it. David Melville says there are currently godwits in the air that are being tracked with satellite tags after having left Alaska. Each season brings a chance to learn something new about the migratory birds. We've also got some young birds in the air for the first time, so these are now are just over two years old. Um, we weren't really expecting many of them to migrate at all this year, but we ended up with quite a few going up to China and Korea. Several then went on up into Russia and wandered around there for a few weeks before crossing over to Alaska. The Godwits will spend the next six months in New Zealand, molting to replace their flight feathers, resting and feeding to fatten up for their return to Alaska in March. Wow, those are some pretty determined birds. Um, some of your final thoughts before we head off tonight. Uh, Robin says about vaccinations, bacon buddies. I remember the first polio shots. We lined up outside her classroom. They went down the line, delivered the shots. No fuss, no complaints and no lollipops, no mucking around. Just got on with it, says Robin. Someone else says waving the big wooden spoon of bigger fines for COVID doesn't work if the wooden spoon's never used. Uh, they go on to say we need to start finding more people and making it known. Forget being kind, start being firm but fair and I love this one why am I being penalised by not getting any bacon butty just because I got my jabs two weeks ago and I had to go and buy my own BK whoops sorry about that um, that is all we've got time for this evening and on first up tomorrow morning hooray for takeaways they're talking to hospitality businesses open for the first time in five weeks Kia ora tato. RNZ News headlines at 6.30 Course Sarah Thompson tōko ingoa the Associate Health Minister has told Checkpoint the government is doing all it can to increase the COVID vaccination rate for Māori, which is lagging far behind the rest of the population. Travel outside of Auckland under Level 3 for funerals or visiting dying relatives will still be heavily restricted and require a Health Ministry exemption. Individuals breaching COVID-19 restrictions will now face a fine of up to $12,000 and the ACT Party says the Climate Change Minister should not be flying to Glasgow for a climate conference. Those are your headlines. Our next news update is at seven. It's BBC prom season and on RNZ Concert we're doing our bit to bring you coverage of the best bits. From six weeks of concerts at London's Royal Albert Hall, tune in to Music Alive Monday to Saturday evenings from eight o'clock and over the coming weeks you can enjoy some of the highlights from one of the world's greatest classical music festivals, the BBC Proms, brought to you by RNZ Concert. 
Na mihi o te pō, ko Yarina so tēnei. Uh, I'm sitting in for Brian tonight. For nights after 7pm, we've got a great show ready for you. Of course, all the regular features, including Tony Stamp and the Sampler. We'll also be uh, meeting some of the Arts Fellowship recipients from Otago University. We'll also be looking into the digital divide that's come up as uh, quite a big topic over lockdown with some stu- school students not having access to devices and the technology and what impacts that will have on their learning. Certainly an issue of equality and one that dovetails very nicely into the detail which we're about to hear about which looks at the issue of name suppression. Has it become a publicity dodging exercise that just generates publicity? Why does this rule that favours those who can afford a lawyer still exists? Let's take a listen. Kia ora, I'm Emile Donovan and today on The Detail... Well, in a move that's probably going to anger a lot of people and that police describe as calculating and deliberate. A young couple from Auckland who had essential workers' status went to the border, got permission, crossed over, drove to Hamilton and then flew to their holiday home in Wanaka. It was an outrageous transgression of the COVID rules and it gave the public and the media a lightning rod to heap scorn on. And heap we did. When we spoke to some of the neighbours, they described the actions as selfish. They don't know whether they've got COVID or not. Um, They put Wanaka at risk. They put Hamilton, Wellington, Queenstown at risk. I thought, quite frankly, it was remarkable behaviour. Completely inexcusable. Pissed off would be a word that would be fairly bented around and and the arrogance of of a sense of entitlement, all these sorts.